Our third speaker today is Professor Yonina Eldar from uh, the Wiseman Institute regarding uh, point of care image analysis, analysis for COVID-19. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Let me share my screen. I'm sorry, one minute. Um, okay, great. So is my screen visible? Is that okay? Yes, it is okay. Okay, perfect. Great. So thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to first thank the organizers for inviting me to speak here today at this workshop. It's really a great honor and pleasure to present and be part of the J Clinic activities. Um, as, as introduced, my name is Yunian Eldar. I'm a professor of math and computer science at the Weizmann Institute in Israel, and I'm also a visiting professor at MIT, as part of which we've been working on several AI-related projects within the J Clinic. So what I want to touch on today are some efforts we've been working on together with a large team of clinicians and AI experts for trying to improve diagnostics and monitoring of COVID-19 using AI on medical images. So let me begin by first acknowledging the amazing team that I've had the pleasure to be working with. So we have uh, several coordinators for the different aspects of this work. Uh, Dr. Ishai Eliada from Mobileye, who's been coordinating the x-ray efforts. Uh, Dr. Nolga Shabshin, who's uh, coordinating the medical efforts, uh, Dr. Shai Begon on the ultrasound side, and Professor Libertario Demi from Italy, uh, who's been coordinating the ultrasound data that we've been working with. Um, we've had many different participants, so several doctors with, in, within our clinical forum at the Weizmann Institute. We have volunteers from different companies in Israel and uh, fantastic collaborators in Italy where we're collecting the ultrasound data. So everything I'm showing today is, of course, a joint effort and would not have happened without this uh, wonderful team of people. So let me describe the challenge that we want to address in our work and present here today. So today, as uh, many people here know, and as we've heard already in the previous talks, uh, the standard routine for diagnostics and monitoring of COVID-19 in the hospital, once patients are admitted to the hospital, is mainly by imaging. And that's really because it, it's faster and has higher sensitivity than RT-PCR. It's uh, much more readily available. It's cheaper. And therefore, at least in the Israeli hospitals, this is definitely the method of choice. Now, when we look at imaging, uh, the best way to, to view COVID is using CT. And that's because, of course, COVID is a respiratory disease. We could see it in the lungs. And in particular, what we see specifically in the lungs are these ground glass opacities that are easy to see or relatively easy to see uh, in a CT machine. The problem is that CT machines are, of course, very expensive. They're highly non-portable. Um, they have, of course, radiation. And maybe the most challenging problem in the context of COVID-19 is disinfecting the CT machine between patients. Uh, the other issue is, of course, that you have to take the patient to the CT machine. And again, going back to the contamination, this, of course, uh, creates a huge difficulty in the hospitals where the patient has to go through um, other patients just to access the machine. So in Israel, and I think this is true in other countries as well, the method of choice today is using x-ray. It's much more readily accessible. There's portable x-ray machines. It's much easier to clean. You could bring it out to the patient. Uh, the patients could be imaged already in the ER room. However, the difficulty is that the findings are not very clear and you need really high expertise in order to be able to uh, detect COVID from the images. And even that is not always possible. So just to give an example, here we see, for example, a patient that has severe COVID-19 and the, the ground glass opacities can be clearly seen. So this is kind of easy to detect that it's a COVID-19 patient. But on the other hand, if you look at these two images, so this is a COVID-19 patient, but this is actually a healthy patient. And this is already much more difficult to be able to detect. Uh, definitely with the naked eye, even of uh, radiologists who have a lot of experience in different lung diseases. The other imaging modality that one can think of using is ultrasound. So if we think of portability and uh, the ability to dis disinfect, ultrasound is really the easiest modality, especially point of care ultrasound. However, currently it's not considered a viable lung diagnostic tool. And that's because of course you can't image the lungs with ultrasound, the air in the lungs reflect the ultrasound beams. So you can't see the lungs directly. What you can see are artifacts that are created by this reflection. So for example, and we'll see more examples later on, if there's fluid in the lungs or decreased air in the lungs, you could see that in different artifacts that are visible in the ultrasound image, but you can't directly image the lungs. And there's just not enough research on how to use this for COVID-19. 
So what was, what was our goal in this project? We wanted to see if we could use AI tools to improve diagnostics and monitoring of this disease, both from X-ray images and from ultrasound images. And that's really what I'm gonna be talking about today. I just wanna mention that we have other ongoing efforts uh, that we're very interested in pursuing. So if there's anyone interested in this, please feel free to contact me. I won't have time to talk about it today, but we've begun uh, efforts in post-corona effects so monitoring recovered patients, again, with ultrasound and X-ray. We've been looking at pooling for rapid testing based on compressed sensing ideas, which we've been working on in our group for several years. And uh, following on Dina's uh, amazing talk, we've also been looking at exploring simple methods for detection uh, via voice and, and heart rate. But I'm not going to be talking about these topics today. We're going to be focusing on the imaging. So let's start by looking at x-ray and seeing more specifically what can be done here. So as we said, of course, because COVID-19 is a respiratory disease, it presents itself in the lungs. And x-ray is very easy to access. It's very easy to deploy, even in community clinics. The challenge, however, as we already uh, pointed out, is that it's hard to distinguish COVID from other respiratory diseases, sometimes also from healthy patients, but definitely from other diseases. Here you see several images from the database that we have. Um, the other difficulty is that, you know, you could think immediately of applying AI, but getting a large data set turned out to be a real challenge. So we started by, of course, seeing what's available online, and the publicly available data sets have really strong limitations to them, at least the ones that we were able to find. So first of all, they don't include many patients. They're typically taken from the same machine with patients in the same position, and they're typically the non-COVID or the controls are usually healthy patients, where really the difficult part is not so much distinguishing between uh, COVID-19 and healthy, but rather COVID-19 and other respiratory diseases. So our first big challenge was to try and put several hospitals together and really create a database where we have what you would get in real time operation. So that means patients in different positions. So this, this patient was lying on their side. Um, you have patients lying down, patients sitting up, patients standing. You have different types of machine. You could see that there are different brightnesses. These are totally different machines. There's no correlation between these machines. So our first challenge was really creating a, a large database, which for the imaging that you're gonna see here today, we had on the order of 2,000 uh, images, 2,000 patients, uh, about 1,000 COVID-19, another 1,000 non-COVID, where the non-COVID patients, the controlled patients, had other respiratory diseases. So that was really the first challenge. Once we had the data set, we started using processing methods in order to try and detect which patients are COVID. So I'll detail these methods on the next few slides, but from a bird's eye view, we basically looked at different pre-processing techniques and segmentation, and then followed that with deep learning methods. And just to show the results we can get, so we get close to 90% detection rate uh, just using these kind of simple techniques on the database um, we put together. And uh, we found that to be very encouraging because PCR, again, at least going by the statistics in Israel, PCR achieves roughly 70% detection accuracy uh, for virus carriers. And here we're looking at uh, around 90% detection. Also here, the results are immediate. They don't, all they require is software. They're readily deployable. They're of course very cheap. They could be done in the community. So uh, we believe that this could really make a difference in X-ray imaging for COVID-19 patients. So let me talk a little bit about the techniques we've used. So we went through several pre-processing methods that were really crucial, so they really helped improve the results. The first, of course, is no normalization. We're looking at data sets that could be very different from very different machines. Uh, we then looked at augmentations, which is very important, both to, of course, increase the data set, but even more importantly, to be able to be robust to different variations that we'd see in, in the patients. And this, the clinicians that we were working with stressed how important this is, that there's many different variations that don't matter clinically, and we really wanted to make sure that our algorithms are insensitive to these variations. The other thing that really helped performance was segmentation. So what we did is we had two channels that were input to the deep learning. One was the image after all of these pre-processing steps, and the other was a segmentation where we segmented the lungs. And basically for every pixel, we gave it a probability of whether or not, you know, what is the probability that it's in the lungs? And that really helped the method focus on the important areas, but without forcing it to focus only on the lungs because we may have had an error in the segmentation. So what we did after these steps is that we input basically a 2D image where one vector was the gray levels and the other vectors were these probabilities that each pixel belongs to the lung. 
This was input into a ResNet that was trained by transfer learning. And then the output of that ResNet was used as a feature that we used in several follow-up steps that I'll show in the next few slides. And then to get the actual detect detection, we use a fully connected network as a decision head. So what was interesting is that by using that feature extractor of the last layer, we can actually get a confidence in our image labeling, uh, which is nice because if we have images that we're not sure about, we could of course consult with an expert radiologist. So what's interesting is that when we tested this, we can see that most of our decisions, COVID or, or non-COVID, were made with almost 100% confidence. So there were only few images that did not have very high confidence. And of course we could see here few errors, like we said, we get about 90% detection. So this was very uh, encouraging as well. Another test that we performed was we asked the radiologists to give us images that they considered very difficult, that they were not able to detect just by looking at the image. Of course, they know what ended up ha happening to the patient. And we put these images into our algorithm. Of course, this was not part of the training set. And what we can see, this is just an example of three of those images that the radiologist classified as difficult. And we see that we get a uh, very high confidence in our decisions, all were detected correctly uh, with very high confidence. So that also shows that the algorithm seems to be uh, pretty robust. Finally, a final layer that we added, which was uh, important and will be important for our follow-up work, is we looked at uh, TSNEs, which is basically just a nonlinear method to reduce the output layer into two dimensions. And then we could take the output for each image and plot it on this two-dimensional plot. And we see that indeed the classifier is working really well. So you see two uh, two areas here, COVID and non-COVID, and we can use this to find images that are similar so that when a new image enters our, our test set, we could see what it's similar to in the database that we have, and that could also indicate uh, what may be the uh, outcome of the patient. So this is something that we found useful as well for the clinicians. So that is kind of what we did in the area of x-ray. I wanna briefly talk about what we did in the area of ultrasound. So in Israel, ultrasound was not really used, um, at least not in the first pandemic, but in Italy, on the other hand, because the numbers were so high and the hospitals were just overflowed with patients, um, there weren't enough x-rays to, to take uh, images. Ultrasound was actually used a lot, point of care ultrasound, and we collaborated with a fantastic group in Italy led by Professor Libertario Demi to uh, use the images that they obtained for the work that I'm going to show now. So as we said, you can't really image lungs uh, directly using ultrasound, but you can see different effects of disease um, in the ultrasound image. So some of the indications that we could see are irregular pleural lines, as you see over here, and what's known as B lines, these vertical lines, which indicate fluids inside the lung. So here you see some more examples. These are the pleural lines that you see in these boxes. Here you see the B lines, these vertical lines, and you also see consolidations here, which all indicate disease. So here our goal was to use annotated frames to detect not only disease, but also the severity of the disease based on these artifacts. So the data set, as I said, we got from Italy, we had about 60,000 frames that were annotated on what's known as an ARDS severity score from zero to three, which indicates the severity of the disease. And here you see the different hospitals, the different data sets. What you also see here is that different probes are used. So uh, different hospitals use different probes, convex or linear, and we exploited this in our method as well. So here the detection comprised of two steps. The first was a signal processing step to detect these B lines and these pleural lines, which are indicative of disease. And then we input this into a deep network that had the first step of restifying convex frames into linear frames, and then training a deep network to output these ARDS scores. So in order to get this detection of the lines, we used a sparsity-based idea, idea in the radon transform domain, where we optimized the parameters based on ground truth annotations that we had thanks to the clinicians we've been working with. So I'm not going to go into the mathematical de details, but just to highlight um, that this was an optimization method based on sparsity in the radon domain. And after we did that, we input the features and the images. We input two channels again, both the convex probes and their restified linear probe into two ResNet backbones, as you see over here, very similar to X-ray. And again, we use the outputs as feature vectors and ended up having a decision head based on a fully connected network that output the 
bottom line ARDS severity score. So ultrasound is of course much more challenging than x-ray. Right now we get an F1 score, the mean and precision, uh, precision and recall as 70%. Of course, we'd like to get a much higher number, but this is already much higher than what is reported in the literature. And to further improve that, we've been working now, I still don't have results to show, this is all work in progress, but now we've been working on doing something very similar to what we did in x-ray, meaning using masks, not just the features themselves, but generating masks from the features which indicate probability of different um, indicatives of artifacts. And we hope that that will bring up the numbers close to what we were able to see with x-ray. So I think I'm, I'm just on time. Um, so going back to what Regina said at the opening, you know, could AI be used? Um, I, I hope and I believe that these results show that at least in the context of imaging, AI could play a very important role. Uh, we believe that this really helps bridge the expert gap. We've already seen very good results using simple networks. Most of the time spent on this project was collecting the data. The actual algorithms were developed really quickly and I'm sure we could further improve them. Uh, any domain knowledge can of course boost the performance. And as was said before, the data sets are crucial to the success of these methods. And we're really, really interested in enlarging the set and collaborating with other hospitals and clinicians so that we can improve the algorithms. The more we can train, the better the algorithms will be. Uh, the, the, all this work is, of course, going to be made public. And therefore, we're really excited about having uh, other people involved. So if anyone is interested in, in sharing data sets and sharing their ideas in this area, please feel free to contact me. We'd be very happy to collaborate. Thank you. Thank you, Janina. We have time for some questions. Let me tell you some. So by how much percentage-wise did you have to increase data volumes, the augmentation, segmentation, et cetera, to get the results that you are getting? OK, so that's a really good question. So in terms of increasing the data size, um, we found that around a factor of two or three more like two was sufficient. We ended up increasing more than that because we wanted to be robust to variations. So this was something that the radiologists really stressed is that um, there's a lot of things that the algorithm should be insensitive to and the augmentations helped for robustness. So what we did is we, we looked at about four or five different aug augmentations. And then for each image, we applied each of those augmentations with a certain probability. So at the end, we increased the data set by about a factor of three. And it was done with different probability on the different augmentations. And another question, um, though ground glass opacity were considered in the model, are bilateral consolidation, pneumothorax, et cetera, also take into account? Can they enhance the performance of the model? So in ultrasound, okay, so, so just to, it, we use the ground glass opacities are mainly seen in CT. Uh, they weren't taken into account in the X-ray model. So the algorithm may have learned them, but it's not something that we explicitly entered. On the other hand, in ultrasound, we are explicitly entering the artifacts. So the, the B lines and the consolidations and the, the irregular plural line, this is something that we're actively entering in ultrasound. And that's because in ultrasound, the images are very difficult to interpret. So if we just let the deep network learn on its own, and there's, there's earlier reports in the literature that tried to do that, the numbers are really, really low. So uh, at least the methods that are used today are not able to figure out by themselves these different artifacts. So in ultrasound, we're entering them manually. That's part of the processing that we're doing. I mean, not manually by, by computer vision algorithms, but we're actually entering them into the deep network, whereas by x-ray, we're letting the algorithm learn it on its own. And also, uh, where, uh, where are you now with respect to using some of these technologies in the clinic, in, the, in you know, actually using it? Yes, so we're, we're, as we speak, actually working on, on clinical deployment um, here in Israel. There's a lot of regulation that has to be, that we have to go through. So of course, all the images that everything was trained on and tested on are, are images now from COVID-19 patients, uh, but it wasn't used in real time. So this is all retrospective data. We're now working on the regulation in order to input this into the hospitals. And we're extremely interested in extending that. I mean, there's nothing particular here about any hospital. So any hospital that is interested, we'd be very, very happy to collaborate with them on that. Thank you very much, Yonina. Okay, thank you. Awesome.